Good morning. And welcome to St. Peter's Lutheran Church on this uh, seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, our worship does begin with a brief order for confession and forgiveness on page 56 in Lutheran Book of Worship. I invite you to stand. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. 
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your merciful ears, O Lord, be open to the prayers of your humble servants, that you may hear our petitions. In all things, help us to ask for what will please you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah, the 44th chapter. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock, I know not any. The word of the Lord. Be God. A reading from Psalm 119, verses 57 through 64. You only are my portion, O Lord. I have promised to keep your words. I entreat you with, I entreat you with all my heart. Be merciful to me according to your promise. I have considered my ways and turned my feet toward your decrees. I hasten and do not carry to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked entangle me, I do not forget your law. At midnight, I will rise to give you thanks because of your righteous judgments. I am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your commandments. The earth, O Lord, is full of your love. Instruct me in your statutes. A reading from Romans, the eighth chapter. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. He, Jesus, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So... When the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds also appeared. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds and the, of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all cause of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears... Let him hear. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. This time we uh, invite the children to give attention to Josh as he has a message for you.
us know where we are in life. It can help us know how to follow God in certain situations. This word of God, the Bible, is a lot like a map when we're hiking. Another thing we need when we go on a hike, I have right here in my backpack, we need some water. We need some water. This is just an essential need when you go on a hike every single time. And it's awesome that God tells us in the psalm that we just read, every single day, God gives us everything we need to follow Him. Everything we need every single day. That's pretty awesome. Now, another thing to do when you go on a hike, as you're walking through nature, through God's creation, is you give thanks to God for how beautiful it is. The trees, the animals that you see, the plants, it's all so gorgeous, and we can thank God for that. And just like we thank God for creation, for nature, every day of our lives, just day-to-day life, we can thank Him for all of the good things that He's given us. Our friends, our family, our house, this church, everything that God has given us. And we can thank Him for that. Just like when we're on a hike and we're thanking Him for the beautiful things that we see on a hike. So maybe this week, when you're with your family, maybe you're with a you can talk to them about the ways we just talked about, of how to follow God, and you can talk about some different ways, too, because there's even more than just these. Let's pray. God, thank you for giving us your word to help us stay safe and help us know how to better follow you. God, thank you for giving us all that we need to follow you every single day. And God, we give thanks to you for all of the good things that you have given us, especially for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and for bringing him back to life. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Our sermon this morning uh, does come from the gospel lesson which we have shared. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, We ask that you would stir up your Holy Spirit within us in such a way that faith in Jesus Christ would be renewed and strengthened. Grant us faith that trusts Jesus' timing for the work of his kingdom in this world and preserve us from passing judgment on others. We ask it in Jesus' name and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen. Well, I am assuming that many, many of you uh, are as upset as I am. Many of us, I know, are upset by what's happening in this country. Uh, The disturbance, the social unrest, the incivility is beyond anything I thought I would ever witness in this country. And you compound that with the COVID-19 ramifications, and uh, I don't know that I've seen our country be in as big a mess as it is now. And, and one of the things that I've been observing that is really deeply dividing our country in a host of areas, whether it's politics or the church or relationships in, within a, how to run a city or a county or a state, is, is under this heading of identity politics. Yeah, it's a relatively new term. I don't know if you've heard that term before or used that term before, identity politics. Uh, a definition of it is it's a term that describes a political approach wherein people of a particular religion, race, social background, class, or other identifying factor form exclusive socio-political alliances moving away from broad-based coalition politics to support and follow political movements that share a particular identifying quality with them. Its aim is to support and center the concerns, agendas, and projects of particular groups in accord with specific social and political changes. Well, that's that's a mouthful, and that's a deep definition, right? It's nice, neat, clean, thorough definition. But what has it become in the United States of America? 
the vitriol, the bitterness, the hatred has led to this cancel culture, instant judgment of who is good and who is bad, who is right and who is wrong, who is righteous and who is evil. And it's everywhere. For example, just look at the two major political parties, Democrat and Republican. You tell me how you voted, tell me how you're registered, and I instantly have a picture of who you are and what you believe and what your agenda is and whether I agree with you or not and whether I like you or not and whether I want to spend time with you or not, which may or may not be fair or fine in the outside secular world, but I hope you agree that it has absolutely no place in the church of Jesus Christ. So just to think about it, for instance, if someone walked into the worship service wearing a MAGA t-shirt, Make America Great Again, would they be welcome? Would they be accepted? Would they be included in the ministry of Jesus Christ in this place? On the other hand, if someone walked in wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, would they be welcome? Would they be included? Would they be asked to participate in the ministry of Jesus Christ in this place? And again, by saying included and welcomed and so forth, I'm not saying that we have to agree with every position a person has. We don't have to agree with each other on every position in all these different realms that we could come up with. But we also should not play identity politics and based simply on one little piece of evidence which may or may not represent who they really are, pass judgment on them and decide whether they're good or bad, whether they're righteous or evil, what their intents are, what their desires are, what their needs are, what their agenda is, and decide whether to exclude them or include them based on our quick judgment. There is something very seductive about passing judgment, finding fault with others, even in the church, maybe sometimes especially in the church. The devil tries to trick us into believing that we are such good Christians, we can determine who belongs and who doesn't. And you know what? We aren't the only ones who have had to wrestle with this issue. Matthew is dealing with something very similar in his congregation for whom he is writing his gospel. And of course, Jesus knew this kind of thing was going to happen because of the power of sin and the, and the devil, the forces of evil in this world. The sinful human nature of all of us combined with the temptations and the power not to be underestimated of the devil, wreaks havoc in God's creation, God's world. And so I, I just invite you to join me in turning again to the gospel reading this morning from Matthew chapter 13, and let's see what Jesus wants to teach us from this parable and its explanation this morning. And again, the context for this, in Matthew's gospel there are five great discourses, great teaching sections of Jesus. Uh, we've already dealt with the first one, which was the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7. And then in more recent weeks, we dealt with the missionary discourse, that is, Jesus teaching and training, equipping his followers, his believers, to be his missionaries in the world in chapter 10. And now, chapter 13, all of it really is parables of Jesus. We call it the parable discourse, a series of parables and their explanations uh, from Jesus in chapter 13. And Pastor Cassie dealt with one last week that had to do with farming, and we get another farming one this week. And so 
when we looked at the parable itself, right, we have this story that Jesus tells to, to teach us, to illustrate, that, that a man has a vineyard and he plants good seed, uh, but then when it starts to reach a certain stage of growth, his workers discover there's weeds mixed in, and they go and tell the boss about that, and he says, ah, oh, an enemy has done this. Well, what do you want us to do about it? You want us to go pull it all up now? No, no, Jesus says, wait. I'll tell you when. The timing's up to me. Just let it grow, because if you do it now, you've got a real risk of displacing some good stuff along with the bad stuff. And besides that, you really don't have the expertise to look into the heart of the matter to distinguish these plants from one another, certainly not at this stage. Just wait. Trust me, and when it's time for the harvest, we'll separate it then. And so uh, the disciples hear that. The crowd hears that. You know, Jesus here in chapter 13, he, he has actually uh, gone down by the Sea of Galilee and and in order to be seen and heard better, he's gotten in a boat, and they push him out a little way, and there's this crowd up on the beach. And so he's teaching them all these, them all these parables, uh, and they finish up, and, you know, how many of the crowd were like saying, well, that's interesting. I guess we need to think about that. I wonder what that means or whatever. And, but they head back to the house. Actually, it might have been Peter's house. We don't know for sure, but there's some evidence of that in Capernaum. And they went back to maybe Peter's house, and, and the disciples are like, I didn't get that one either. <laughs> Please explain that to us, Jesus. And so Jesus says, well, these parables I'm telling you are about the kingdom of heaven. And of course, in the big picture, as we have the whole gospel uh, unveiled to us, we see that, of course, the kingdom of heaven is Jesus. It's embodied in Jesus Christ. He is ushering in a new age, a new kingdom. And all who believe in him and strive to follow him and cling to him, they are a part of his kingdom. They are the men and women of the kingdom. And so Jesus is teaching us about the kingdom here in chapter 13. And so in this particular section, he says, look, this, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is how things are. Uh, the land is the world. And the farmer, we come to find out, the, the one who's planting is Jesus. And Jesus puts good seed into his vineyard. Jesus, through our baptism, has planted within us the gift of faith. Faith which forgives, faith which saves us, faith which delivers us, faith which empowers us. And at the same time, everyone in this world has a sinful human nature. And so the, the, uh, uh, the, the field where the seeds are planted, uh, in a very real sense, is, is really not only the world, but specifically the church at work in the world, the kingdom of heaven that's begun but not yet been fulfilled. And so people are in the church and what this parable is saying is even in the church and certainly in this world there are people that are wheat and people that are weeds and as time goes on we start thinking we know who the weeds are the temptation the sin that we are being warned about this morning is passing judgment on other people because we think we have reached a certain level of faith that we can discern good from bad, righteous from evil. And moreover, not only can we figure it out, we want to do something about it. We need to get rid of those people. We don't want those people in our midst. And so there really are two things that Jesus is saying, you know, is we need to beware of that kind of thinking. So should we get rid of these people? And Jesus says, no. The truth of the matter is you don't have the ability to tell the difference. The devil may trick you into thinking you do, but Lord, it's obvious. Look what they did. Look what they said. What, look what. You don't have the expertise, Jesus says. You don't know what I know about the inner heart of that person. You don't know what I know about where that person is heading. 
you don't know what's about to happen as far as somebody leading that person to repentance and faith. Don't pass judgment and certainly don't take action on the judgment you've arrived at. Don't pull out the weeds. It's not your job. It's not my job. It's not our job. Well, what is our job? Our job as wheat is to grow, to grow the kingdom of God. And so this morning, really, Jesus wants us to know, Matthew wants his church to know, and Matthew wants us to know that, that we are called to trust Jesus' timing, Jesus' timetable for bringing about the judgment. There actually is a word of comfort and hope here to say, trust Jesus. He's got it under control. We might be scared to death. We might be worried to death about what's happening or what these people might do or those people might do or what's happening in our country and so forth. But Jesus is saying, trust me. Even though it doesn't look like I'm in control, I am. Even though it doesn't look like my kingdom is going to win out, it will. And for those who keep the faith, there is this incredible reward. And so Jesus wants us to, to trust his timetable for the kingdom and not judge others based on their identity. And Tom Long, writing on this, has said, this text conveys confident good news to the church. The victory of God's kingdom, even the effectiveness of the church, is not dependent on human efforts to keep the church pure. The parable of the weeds and the wheat is primarily a call to remember that ultimately the harvest and the victory belong to Almighty God and God alone. It depends alone upon God's patient working in the world. And so I, I don't know about you, but I know in this whole arena the thing that I wrestle with most is the devil gets in there whispering in my ear and, and I start assuming, you know, right off the bat in any kind of debate or situation that I'm the wheat and the person acting, thinking differently than me is the weed and that I have the ability to discern this. And then I end up worrying and agonizing, fretting and fussing about who is good and who is bad, who belongs in, who doesn't. In other words... I start playing God, and that's the real I issue. That's the heart of the matter. The sin is when we turn in on ourselves and start trusting our own judgment, our own analysis, we're putting our faith in ourselves in spite, instead of Almighty God who has come to us in Jesus Christ. And if I go down that road too far, not only am I guilty of this playing God and, and, and passing judgment on others, but then I get discouraged because I can get convinced that, that our side's losing. And if our side's losing, maybe it's not all true after all. Maybe God's not all powerful and all knowing. And, and Jesus is not in the process of bringing his kingdom to fulfillment. And if I turn away from faith, if I let this discouragement cause me to give up, oh, then I am in big trouble. Then, then I do find myself not in the company of wheat, but in the company of the weeds. But it's, it's because of this predicament that God did first come to us in Jesus Christ. And he took on the power of the devil. He took on the forces of evil and he overcame them for us at the cross. Jesus as he has promised, Jesus crucified, risen, and ascended into heaven, Jesus will come again victoriously to judge the living and the dead, to judge and to supervise the separating of the wheat and the weeds. He will come to fulfill his kingdom and he will oversee his angels who will take care of the judgment. Our job is simply to keep the faith and to keep growing the kingdom as God's spirit gives us ability. It is Jesus, the one who knew no sin, who takes our sin as though it were his own. Jesus becomes sin for us, and in the exchange, we sinners get his righteousness. 
and the incredible blessings of being his healing agents in this sin-sick world. So, for this morning, it really is a message of hope and comfort to us from Jesus in this parable. Jesus is saying to you and to me, no matter what you see around you in this world, no matter how chaotic things appear to be and out of control and going down the tubes and, and no matter how much it looks like God is not there and that the message of the gospel is not true, don't fall for that. Cling to the faith with which you have been graced by the power of the Holy Spirit. Daily embrace God's word. Daily be in prayer. Daily be seeking God's word for your life and then take action on where you see God leading you individually to do God's work, Jesus' kingdom work in this world. Do not despair. Do not despair over the identity politics that are ripping our country apart. But from a Christian love standpoint, face up to it and preach Jesus' message of love and forgiveness, change, repentance, the hope and help and power of the Holy Spirit to make all things new. Keep the faith, grow the kingdom, and leave everything else up to God. May the Holy Spirit add blessings to these words for Jesus' sake. Amen. response to the preaching and hearing of God's word, we confess our faith utilizing the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord God, you are the sower of good seed in our lives. <clears throat> Pour out your Holy Spirit upon that the seed of your Holy Word would fall on fertile soil within us and take root and grow. Grant us the amazing gift of faith that we would follow Jesus in obedience, joy, and love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. O oh Lord, our rock and redeemer, there is no one like you. You alone are God. As you have called the whole church to be your witnesses, proclaiming to the world the good news of him who has been prophesied since ancient times, give us all boldness to declare your salvation and sow the seeds of your word wherever we go. Lord, in your mercy. God of all hope, sometimes it seems like everything around us is futile. Help us to rely on faith instead of feelings, upon what we know to be true because of your promises, instead of the false signals given through the sorrows of this present time. Cause us to consider these trials in light of the glory that awaits us through Christ. Give the hopeless courage to wait with patience for what they do not see, yet know to be true because of the witness of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you all of our dear brothers and sisters in our congregation who are in need of your tender care and your healing powers. We lift up to you, especially this day, Brady, Kelly and Carolyn, Buck, Bunny, Sam, Harry, Judy, Dan, Landis, Linda, Pam, Warren, Corey, Mike and Kristen, Carmi, John, and Bishop John. We also lift up to you, O oh Lord, the family and loved ones of Lewis Richardson. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for church leaders and missionaries who are called to serve you. We pray that you would guide their steps help them to glorify you. We pray especially for our North American Lutheran Church, our Bishop Dan and Dean Nathan, our missionaries David, David Davis in Brazil and the Ekas in India, and our NALC mission congregations here in South Carolina. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always. And also with you. We invite you to turn and share the peace from where you are.
Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his, through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. 